do is first take a big, 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 big uh, uh, look at the picture. Then you walk up close, right? Let's say this is the picture. You walk up close, look at the detail. Oh, wow, really beautiful face or whatever. But then step back again and see that face in contrast with the whole picture, you see? Don't forget the whole picture, you know? Uh, and then kind of walk away. So next time go to a museum, remember what I said, okay? That's kind of what I do when I go to a museum. I first look at it, then I want to go see some detailed stuff, what they've done. Then I want to go back and now look at the big picture in light of that detail, okay? What often people, people uh, what often mistake people do in uh, their uh, physics class or their chemistry or their math or whatever is uh, they kind of look at it quickly from the, uh, you know, overall. Then they go, and then week by week they're learning different material, right? But what they're really doing is just looking at little pieces, little pieces, little pieces. Oh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. But they don't take a step back and see, okay, what did I just learn? What is its relation to what came in the past? What is its relation to what comes in the future? How does it fit in the whole picture of chemistry or in the whole picture of physics, you know? So uh, that's kind of the way I want you to do is, too, is what have you learned this semester? Okay, we started with electric fields, we went to this, and we went to Gauss's law. Then we learned about potential, then we learned how to find potential, we learned how, what the meaning of potential is, we learned what capacitors are, then we went to circuits using capacitors, then we went resistors, and then you see, go through that sequence and kind of try to make connections and look at the bigger picture. Particularly now in physics three, you can not only take a, pic, a big picture of physics three, but you can now say, how is physics three connected to physics two? How is physics two connected to physics one? You know, in one you learn about mechanics, you learn about work energy theorem. In physics two, you learn about thermodynamics, the first law of thermodynamics and so on. Oh, you see, the work energy theorem in physics one is really connected to the thermodynamics. And what we're learning here is also somehow connected to physics two and physics one. Like you just saw in the problem I learned, I used moment of inertia, right? So don't forget what's come in the past. So you try to make those bigger connections. And then when next semester you go to physics four, you learn about modern physics, atoms, relativity, and particle physics, and then try to, oh, now, now you've got the whole thing in your hand, you see? So that's, uh, that's really always a good idea to do. Okay, the next thing that we did is we went inside of the sphere, and we said, how do we find the electric field inside? Then we said, well, if it's a conductor, all the charges on the outside, so the electric field inside is zero. If it's an insulating sphere, then uh, only a portion of the charge is enclosed here, right? So we learned how to find the portion of that charge, and we learned how to find the electric field, therefore, insulating sphere. And then we did an insulating sphere of variable density, you see? Then what did we do? The next kind of symmetry is cylindrical symmetry, right? How do you find the electric field here? How do you find the electric field there? Well, you, you use a little Gaussian surface, right? and then a little Gaussian surface over here, and then so on. You can do the symmetry. And then there was one other one that we can use Gauss's law for. Which one was that? You see, I proved my point. You guys have forgotten. See, you're just looking at the little detail of the picture. A sheet, right? A plate. And then we use this kind of uh, symmetry, All right? So there's three symmetries for which Gauss's law allows you to find the electric field quicker. And then once you get the electric field, how do you find the force? QE, right? That's it. Now, uh, then we went on into chapter 25. We learned what is a potential, how to find potential, what is a potential field, equal potentials, and so on and so forth, right? Now we're coming here to chapter 29 and magnetism. So in chapter 29, what did we do? And how is it connected to what we did in the past? In chapter 29, we covered
what was the basic equations? So what's the analogous equation to this in chapter, in chapter 23? Yeah. Now, if you really think about it, when we were in chapter 23, you really didn't have to devote a whole chapter to this. It was more important in chapter 23 to teach you how to get the E. We didn't need to devote a whole chapter just to talk about F equals QE, right? But in for magnetism, we devoted a whole chapter to show you how to get the force on, the, on a, a charge. Why? Because it is a little more complex of an equation, right? F equals QV crossed into B. And then this one, does it have an analogy in the chapter 23? No. Nothing. OK? There's nothing there. There's no analogous equation for that. OK? And then in chapter 29, we learned the torque. And then in the, the electrical counterpart of that was uh, P crossed into E, right? Now we come to chapter 30. And now we go into and we tr explore how is the B created, you see? So we're going to need counterparts to uh, this here. You see here this one? The electric field of a single charge is KQ over R squared. Then if you want to find the electric field of a bunch of individual charges, I need to add that up. And if those bunch of charges are a, are a rod, then I need to integrate. So I need now a similar analogous equation to find the magnetic field of a charge. What's that equation? Right? Nature is symmetric. There better be another equation symmetric to this. And the equation is known as Biot's of art law. Okay? It's a dB dB is mu zero i over four pi dl crossed into r hat over r squared. And again, the, it's a more complicated looking equation. This is the counterpart of this. dE is k dQ r squared. So if I want to find the magnetic field of a bunch of uh, 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 charges, then I would have to add, integrate that. So let's see the difference here. This one is telling us in order to create a magnetic field, you need a current. You can't just have a single charge standing there and creating a B field. The charge has to be moving, OK? Then it creates a B field. But how about electric fields? If, can the charge stand still and create an electric field? Yeah. Can the charge move and create an electric field? This one says it doesn't matter if it's moving or not. It doesn't care. It doesn't care whether it's moving or not. It really doesn't matter. If it's standing still, it creates electric field. Moving creates electric field. Okay. This one says it's got to be moving to create a magnetic field. You see? OK. Then, um, uh, then I'll get into the detail of how to use this uh, formula, right? the equations. Now, the, now we need a counterpart to Gauss's law, right? OK, so now we need a counterpart analogous equation for Gauss's law. And that equation is known as Ampere's law, OK? Integral. 